Hey, hot dogs. Um, Mr. Field here. So, um, yeah, we're past Easter now. It's kind of crazy to think about. Um, so hopefully you guys had a good one. I know it was a weird one. Um, I know it was weird for me, um, especially not being close to family, um, up here being a transplant to the area and everything. Um, so it was definitely weird not going home and seeing family. So hopefully you, you and your family had a good Easter and did what you could to enjoy it and um, be together in these crazy times. So um, with that being said, we'll, we'll kind of keep going forward. All right. So we um, last week we started talking about water all right, and water resources. So we were talking about water scarcity and what you know kind of makes it scarce and looking at a couple of examples. <clears throat> I know um, that's what you had to do. You had to do a little bit of research into um, scarcity of water. So now we're going to look at one of the biggest things that most people do understand a little bit better about water is water pollution. All right. So, you know, making it unavailable to drinking. So we watched that Ted talk, or at least hopefully you played that Ted talk, um, that talked about how to make dirty water clean. So this is kind of that next tangent from that. Um, we're going to go off of that and look at the different types of water pollution out there. All right. And try to bring in some real world examples to each of them if we can. All right. So, um, and yeah, so we're going to get into water pollution and that'll be it for today. All right. So there's two big broad terms that we got to understand with water pollution. All right. There's point source pollution and non point source pollution. Okay. And this is not just talking about water pollution, but it usually always shows up in water pollution. Okay, point source pollution is just that. Okay, we can point directly at the source, all right? We can see a factory dumping chemicals into a river, stream, lake, ocean, all right? We can see the discharge out of a cruise liner or a container cargo ship, um, all right? We can see that happening, all right? Non-point source pollution, though, that's really hard. This is spread out over a large area, and we really can't tell where it came from. We know what it came from. But we can't tell specifically that it came from so and so person or business, all right? So think like oil on roads, all right, or in a parking lot, all right? Anytime it rains, we can always see in the puddles, you know, that oil, that little rainbow pattern that shows up, all right? But we have no idea whose car that came from, all right? Even if we would do some chemical tests, we would be able to figure out what type of oil it is, but that only limits us or narrows down who uses that type of oil, but it could be a really popular brand. So we have no idea who it actually came from. All right. So again, that's non-point source pollution. We can't look directly at the source. We can see and we can tell that there's a lot of people using that. So we know what it comes from, but we can't pinpoint and say, this is the person that's doing this polluting. All right. All right, so there's a couple of different things here. I'm going to move my screen just a little bit. There we go. All right, and one of the ones that oftentimes gets overlooked is nutrient pollution, okay? So going back to those biogeochemical cycles from the very beginning of the trimester, all right? So this is excess phosphorus and other nutrients that plant life, all right? That's really the key is that plant life needs it. All right. So, and the buildup of these excess nutrients in bodies of water is called eutrophication. All right. It happens. All right. It's part of the, all of those biogeochemical cycles. It's going to build up in water. And that's fine when it's the natural levels and we're not doing anything to add to it. Okay. However, nutrient pollution itself, so the addition of extra nutrients. All right, can cause cultural eutrophication, aka human caused eutrophication. Okay, this is how, for a classic example, the Midwest, all right, and the Great Plains regions impact the water quality in the Gulf of Mexico. All right, so if you've heard of um, the dead spot in the Gulf of Mexico, that's what this is. This is a buildup of excess nutrients that caused an algal bloom. All right, which then used up all the dissolved oxygen or almost all, okay, which then killed off a lot of ocean life plus the algae itself, which used even more, all right, dissolved oxygen for decomposition. And now all of a sudden we have very, very little dissolved um, oxygen for aquatic life um, to be sustained, all right. 
Sorry, guys, my dog is wanting a lot of attention, so I'm having the pet in while giving you guys a lecture. So, uh, sorry about that um, if I seem a little bit distracted. Um, all right, so that's that is the process of eutrophication. I've got a couple of videos that I typically show, or at least a few graphics. I'll probably end up putting those in as links. Feel free to watch them to kind of help you understand the process, but um, that's really what it would do. It would be there to help you understand the process. You know, I won't put an assignment with it. Uh, you might get an Ed puzzle on eutrophication later this week, but who knows? Um, it's a pretty niche topic, so we'll just kind of talk about it and go from there. All right, toxic chemical pollution. All right, so occurs when harmful chemicals are released into waterways. These can be organic or inorganic compounds. All right, harms ecosystems, causes human health problems. All right, this is one of the classic examples of uh, environmental injustice, if you will. All right, so um, there was a the Cuyahoga River. All right, this is one of the big case studies that really kind of spurned the use of environmental science and being aware of what we do to the environment. Uh, the Cuyahoga River in the 70s that literally burned for a couple of weeks because the amount of toxic chemicals that the factories and companies were putting into this river, um, and it ended up igniting somehow, so catching on fire, and it burned, and it burned, and it burned, all right? So you don't really often think of water catching on fire, um, and really that's not what was happening. It was all these toxic chemicals that were catching on fire, all right, um, and then just burning for several weeks before it was ever put under control, and this is really what kind of helped lead to the EPA and some other guidelines out there. Okay. Sediment and thermal pollution, things that often get overlooked, all right? Sediment pollution, all right? That's that soil that we, in erosion that we talked about, uh, seems like forever ago, all right? So unusually large amounts of sediment that can change an aquatic environment. All right, so this, again, it occurs naturally, but we're talking about crazy mass movements of land that is ending up in the water. So usually it happens in like construction, um, or after a fire or some other natural disaster that removes all of those anchors to the soil. So all the plant life. All right. So again, we kind of talked about that. All right. So, and now we're seeing this happen. All right. And what it does is it degrades the water quality. All right. It also reduces the photosynthesis rates um, to the point where it can disrupt the food chains um, that are in the ecosystem, the water ecosystems. All right. Thermal pollution is just that. It is a heat source that raises or drastically lowers the temperature of a water system. Um, and you, one rule of thumb is that the warmer water gets, the less oxygen it can hold. All right. So the hotter the water, the less dissolved oxygen it has, which isn't good for the aquatic life. All right. So mostly the fishes, but there's a lot of other aquatic life out there. It's not just fish, but that's the first thing that everybody kind of thinks of. All right. So there are laws on the books that factories that pull water from a source and then put for cooling or heating, um, whatever it, they use it for in their process, if they put it back in the water system, it has to be within like two degrees of what they took it out at. So if they take it out and it's 47 degrees, they have to put it back in two degrees plus or two degrees minus of 47. So either up to 49 or down to 45 degrees. All right. Biological pollution. This is what that uh, uh, Lifesaver bottle is getting at. All right. So the biological pollution occurs when pathogens in, enter the waterway. So bacteria and viruses. All right. So again, this is what um, the Lifesaver bottle is really filtering out. Okay, cause, these cause more human health problems than any other form of water pollution. In fact, these are the ones that really do cause human health problems. All right, the other ones, you're not really going to get sick too severely um, from that specifically. What you're going to get sick from is the biological pathogens that are inside those things. So if there's a lot of sediment that's now in the water, all right, well, now all of a sudden that's bringing in all the bacteria and viruses that are stored in the soil and they're now in the water so you have greater access to them. All right. Um, water treatment facilities is what we do to reduce biological pollution. All right. Probably the biggest 
thing that we got to think about is the groundwater pollution that happens. So groundwater, all right, that underwater storage, all right, in semi-porous um, aquifers, okay, if we pollute at the surface, it's going to leach through the soil, all right, and it's going to eventually get into the groundwater. And the problem with that, all right, is that chemicals are going to break down more slowly in groundwater than they do in surface water. Right? They're underground. They don't have access to the sun. The sun breaks down a lot of these um, pathogens. It just takes a lot of time to do that. Well, if you get rid of the sun and it's now underground, you don't have that happening. All right. And then the other biggest thing is it's underground. Unless you're actively using that groundwater, you have no idea um, if it's polluted until you go to use it. All right. Um, so the biggest thing with groundwater pollution is in prevention. So doing things at the surface to prevent the um, introduction of these chemicals or pathogens into the groundwater supply. All right. Probably the biggest one that we can think about all right, is when it comes to ocean water pollution. All right. Think of oil spills. All right. So BP, Deepwater Horizon, uh, the Exxon Valdez. All right, there's a couple other ones out there. But another thing that often gets overlooked is that natural oil seeps are our single lar largest source of oil introduction into um, ocean water. Okay, um, And then the other things that we see is bioaccumulation of mercury pollution. All right, So this is something that we see um, happening not just with mercury but some other heavy metals and even now plastic. All right, We'll get into plastic pollution in the water um, later on. Um, this week or maybe next week. I don't know which one yet uh, because that's the one that we kind of think of is the plastic pollution now in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'm going to save that for its own topic just because it is something that's a little bit more popular and starting to get to be better understood now um, compared to where it was in the early 2000s. Okay, so again, some ways that we've gone about trying to control this is just regulating and decreasing um, what can happen with water when we use it. So the Clean Water Act set water pollution standards, requires permits to release point source pollution. And then it also really helped fund sewage treatment plant construction and updating it. All right. So for Frankfurt, that's up past the golf course. It's actually a really neat um, process that it goes through and it's got a lot of science to it and um, what they go about doing it uh, um, there to make sure the water stays clean and what they have to do to treat it. Um, it smells, the beginning of the process really does smell, but by the end of it, you, it, it's gone. The smell is gone. All right. Cause again, they're treating, um, wastewater, um, from everybody's home. So, um, it is an interesting thing and they do love giving tours. So, um, if you're really, really bored and you want to see that process, phone them up and they will be happy to set up a tour to walk you through the process. Um, Unfortunately, you know, we can't do anything like that. Maybe I can get them to do like a virtual tour or something uh, and we'll go from there. All right. Um, so the water treatment process, we'll kind of get into that a little bit, but not too much. All right. So we're going to call it quits for today. Um, hope you guys are doing all right. Um, again, I hope you guys had a great Easter. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. All right. Um, again, this is a very crazy circumstance of what we have to be doing. So keep giving it your best effort. Um, keep helping out your families. Keep helping out each other. Um, keep holding each other to high standards. Don't let your friends slack and you do the work. All right. Um, you guys just keep doing what you have to do to get through this. All right. Because I know that's what we're doing. Um, I definitely miss you guys. Hope you guys are doing okay. Um, I know pretty much every teacher that I've talked to, both for Frankfurt and across the country that I have as friends um, are definitely missing their students. Um, we're thinking about you guys a lot. So uh, keep up the good work. And until next time, guys.